Welcome to the Bogosity Podcast for the 13th of August, 2012. The podcast that can go from freezer to microwave. This is your host, Shane Killian. Let's enhanced interrogate the news of the bogus. We've covered before stories of government shutting down kids' lemonade stands. Now, a 13-year-old entrepreneur in Holland, Michigan, had his hot dog stand shut down because it competed with established city restaurants, and the consequences for his family were devastating. Nathan Dzinski set up his hot dog stand with the permission of a local business. The owner of a sporting goods store allowed Nathan to set up the stand in front of his business in the hopes that he would gain more clients from Nathan's customers. The enterprising young man did this to help his parents through a rough time. His mother suffers from epilepsy and his father, multiple sclerosis. Not only do they have trouble holding down full-time jobs and have a lot of medical expenses, the amount they get in disability, Medicaid, and food assistance just isn't enough to cover it. So Nathan figured that if his hot dog stand could help them stay above water, then it was worth doing. Um, I was trying to help my mom and my dad because they're both on disability. My mom has epilepsy and my dad has multiple sclerosis, so I'm just trying to bring in some money for them and the household when they're struggling. But he only got to sell hot dogs for 10 minutes. That's when a city zoning officer came by and told him that he wasn't allowed to set up a hot dog stand unless it was connected with a brick and mortar restaurant downtown. I thought she was talking about reliable sports and as soon as I heard my business name I was like wow I'm getting shut down already and I haven't even started. And this was after getting all the necessary permits to do it. According to his mother. We went and we talked with Anna from uh, City Hall on the third floor and she told us that it was fine Um, and we wanted to make sure we stopped in there in person about a month ago and spoke with her in person and asked her do we need a you know like business permit license and she said no but as it turns out the city bans all food carts except at their annual tulip festival that aren't connected with established brick and mortar restaurants downtown hear it from city stooge greg robinson if we are setting up um food carts, food wagons uh, that compete with those restaurants that aren't paying, for example, the assessments uh, and the same things that those property owners are paying to provide the amenities downtown, uh, that could be a problem. But the problem is the owner of the sporting goods store pays the same higher downtown taxes as the restaurants do. This is just an excuse for restaurants who have bought favors from local politicians to be free from competition from 13-year-old kids who are just trying to help their families. Unbelievable. Hey, Robinson, if your precious downtown restaurants can't even hold their own against 13-year-old kids with hot dog stands, are they really so great? Protection rackets are abominations enforced by the mob. They're not any better when that mob is made up of elected and appointed bureaucrats. The fact of the matter is, it doesn't even matter that Nathan is 13 and his parents are too sick to work full-time. Anyone should have the right to do what Nathan did, no matter how old, no matter how well off. Entrepreneurship makes all our lives better, and it should be rewarded, not punished. And if the restaurants downtown can't take the competition, well, maybe they need to step up their game. Sadly, Nathan and his parents are now homeless. They're having trouble staying together. Nathan and his mother are staying at the Holland Rescue Mission. But his father can't join them because he takes narcotic painkillers for the chronic pain he suffers due to his MS. I guess homeless people are welcome at shelters unless they suffer from chronic pain that needs medicating. Nathan and his parents weren't going to just give up. Well, our next step is to file a petition at City Hall to see if we can get on the agenda to either amend or modify in some way the current ordinance uh, prohibiting him from doing what he'd like to do. When they appealed to City Hall, however, Mayor Kurt Dykstra defended the city's ordinance, saying it was to protect downtown restaurant owners. So there you have it. According to government, the profits of established city businesses are more important than a family losing their home. I guess Mayor Dykstra feels good that he protected his downtown cronies while sentencing a sick couple and their son to homelessness. Remember this next time someone tells you government is here to help the poor. Remember this next time someone tells you that it's libertarians who are heartless and don't care for the poor and the homeless. 
And remember that as long as you're supporting this kind of government regulation, you're condemning families just like this one. The only thing unique about this case is, this time it's visible, but the unseen effects of government regulations hurt millions. Indeed, there may not even be a single one of us that isn't adversely affected by them, even the ones who supposedly profit when the long-term picture is viewed. No, government harming the disabled to protect their corporate cronies isn't an isolated incident. It happens all the time, nationwide, and even all over the world. Case in point, visually impaired people are suffering what the Electronic Frontier Foundation calls a book famine, resulting in 95% of books published in rich countries and 99% of books in poor countries being completely inaccessible to the blind, solely because of government protectionism in the form of copyright laws such as the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. The issue is Digital Rights Management, or DRM. Even from the early days of the DMCA, programmers have had their projects shut down and even been arrested themselves for nothing more than trying to make software to read out ebooks as speech or convert it to Braille so they can be accessible to the visually impaired. For example, Dmitry Sklyarov was arrested in July of 2001 for giving a speech at DEF CON in Las Vegas about ebook security. His company, Elcomsoft, produced software to make PDFs readable via text-to-speech for the blind. At Adobe's behest, and with the support of the Association of American Publishers, he was arrested and held until August when he was released on $50,000 bail and wasn't even allowed to leave Northern California. Understand, Sklyarov and his company were Russian, and nothing he did violated Russian law in any way. But apparently, just by coming to America, that was enough to subject him to the jurisdiction of the DMCA and be arrested at the urging of the federal government's corporate cronies. Fortunately, he was allowed to return to his home in Russia in December 2001 and was acquitted by a jury a year later. But what an ordeal to go through just to help the visually impaired. Now, ten years later, the blind still don't have proper access to ebooks. An international treaty formed the World Intellectual Property Organization, or WIPO, basically an international DMCA. According to the EFF, only 57 countries, less than half of WIPO member states, have exceptions in their laws to allow books to be read out or converted to Braille for the visually impaired. And there's also a lot of questions about moving this material across borders, even electronically. It's hard to get changes through the system. Most WIPO member states hold secret, informal meetings to make most of their decisions. And it all seems to be done at the behest of the publishers, not the readers. In the free market, the customer is always right. In the corporatist market, the customer is always someone you can ignore. Shane, I hear you cry. What about all the stuff the government does for the poor, the elderly, and the disabled, like Social Security? Social Security is a good deal that takes care of us when we're retired or disabled. Well, that may have been true at one point, but it just isn't anymore. According to a study by the Associated Press, people retiring today are the first ones who will have paid more in Social Security taxes than they will receive in benefits, and it's only going to get worse as time goes on. At first, Social Security was a sweet deal. Payroll taxes were low, and if you retired in 1960, you could expect to get seven times more in benefits than you paid in. You could even get more if you were a low-income worker and lived to about 80 years old. Even by 1985, workers of any income level could retire and get more than what they paid in, although inflation ate up a lot of that. But now, that's not the case. A middle-income couple retiring last year would have paid about $598,000 in Social Security taxes, but if the man lived to 82 and the woman to 85, they'd only get $556,000 in benefits. Of course, Social Security benefits are progressive, so if you're a low-income worker, you'll still get a bit more than what you paid in, but don't expect that to last long either. According to the Social Security trustees, the system will be broke in 2033 if it stays on its present course. Of course, these are the people who said it would run surpluses until 2017, when it really started running deficits in 2011, so by their track record it may happen a lot sooner than that. 
It's hard to understand why so many liberals cling to the obviously false claim that impending Social Security insolvency is a myth. Unless, of course, they care more about their political cronies than about retirees and the disabled. How long are they going to keep pretending that Social Security is not going broke? How long are they going to keep demeaning people trying to raise awareness of the truth just to secure their own political positions? And how long is it going to take before we stop letting them get away with it? Once again, President Barack Obama shows how much he cares about our precious constitutionally protected rights. Not at all. He's just signed a bill directly infringing on our rights of free speech, prohibiting protesting at military funerals, despite the fact that the Supreme Court ruled that protesting at military funerals was protected speech under the First Amendment. Of course, we all know about the insane and hateful Westboro Baptist Church, who protests at the funerals of military servicemen and women because... Well, I'm not really sure why. But for whatever reason, however much we might not like it, it is absolutely their right to engage in this activity. And this was confirmed in Snyder v. Phelps, where the Supreme Court ruled 8 to 1 in favor of the church and its protests. But that didn't stop Obama from signing into law the Honoring America's Veterans and Caring for Camp Lejeune Families Act of 2012. Man, we really need to get the One Subject at a Time Act passed. Maybe it makes some kind of acronym. Let's see. Uh, the H-A-V-C-C-L-F. Have Kakelf. No, maybe not. Anyway, this act makes it illegal to protest within 300 feet of a military funeral, or for two hours before and after the service. Violations could result in up to $50,000 in statutory damages. Hey, Obama, if you're really worried about what happens at the funerals of soldiers, how about making sure there are fewer of them? End these stupid and senseless wars and bring our troops home. The fact that you haven't, especially after you promised to do so, puts to lie your pandering here. You don't care about the troops. You only care about what's good for you politically. Sorry, but free speech is free speech. You can't pick and choose whom you're going to let speak and where. This is how government tyranny starts. You oppress the people that everyone hates, who can't get much support in favor of them. Racists and other bigots, pirates, hackers, whatever. It won't end with them. It never does. It always expands. The best way to defend against this is to not let government do it at all. Barack Obama has blatantly violated his oath of office, but hardly for the first time, and it doesn't even seem to bother him. But he has gone directly against the Supreme Court now. I'll tell you one thing. I don't want to hear any of you whiny, apologetic Obamatons bleeding on about how Obama's been stopped by the Republicans or the courts from doing whatever he needs to do to fix the country. Obama is doing exactly what he wants to do, and he always has. He's bypassed Congress numerous times, and now he's directly going against the Supreme Court as well. If there was ever a totalitarian president in this country, Obama is it. None of the other two branches are any impediment to him. As for the law itself, it may have unintended consequences, as pretty much all laws do. The law may stop counter-protests like the ones that happened in Missouri and Texas to provide a show of support and to shield the grieving loved ones from the hateful signs held by the backwards religious extremists. Meanwhile, Westboro spokes bigot Stephen Drain said that the law isn't going to change their plans at all, and they're going to continue all of their planned protests. Man, I'm going to hate myself for saying this. I really feel dirty here. But it needs to be said even if I have to take a shower afterwards. Way to go, Westboro Baptist Church. Do not let anyone infringe on your right to free speech. Because Westboro defying this infringement of their free speech protects our free speech rights as well. Now see what you made me do, Obama. I'm having to take the side of hateful bigots that I can't stand one bit. But you know what? It's better than siding with you because you're worse than they are. And at the end of the day, I at least will have stood up for my principles. What will you have stood for, other than once again betraying our principles and our precious liberties for the sole purpose of pandering in an election year? And now it's time to wash down the drain of untruth this week's biggest bogan emitter. 
And once again, it goes to everyone's favorite New Keynesian, the Sylvia Brown of economics, Paul Krugman, who's so much of an Obamaton that apparently three and a half years of an Obama presidency just wasn't enough to undo the last two of Bush's. Oh, except when good stuff happens, like meager job growth a few months ago, that was all Obama's doing. Here's Krugman in a recent blog post, quote, The overriding story of the past few years is not Mr. Obama's mistakes, but the scorched earth opposition of Republicans who have done everything they can to get in his way, and who now, having blocked the president's policies, hope to win the White House by claiming that his policies have failed. Hey, didn't I just say in the last story that I don't want to hear any of you whiny, apologetic Obamatons bleeding on about how Obama's been stopped by the Republicans or the courts or whoever from doing what he needs to do to fix the country? We're getting our junk groped at airports. That wasn't Congress. There was no act of Congress that created these pat-down procedures. That was Obama. The war in Libya was done without congressional approval, even done when Congress wasn't even in session. He bypassed Congress's laws entirely when he issued an executive order arbitrarily allowing illegal immigrants 16 and younger to stay in the country. He made up his own rules regarding the GM and Chrysler bailouts. And he, without any act of Congress backing him up, fined oil producers for not using cellulosic ethanol despite the fact that there is no cellulosic ethanol being produced anywhere for them to use. And we just heard how he openly defied the Supreme Court and signed legislation to allow government to shut down protests that the Supreme Court has already declared free speech. Regardless of whether or not you think these things are good or bad, it's clear that Congress is no impediment to this president. The courts are no impediment to this president. Add to that two facts. First, The president had a majority in both houses of Congress for his first two years and had a filibuster-proof majority in the Senate if you count the two independents who caucused with Democrats. And second, since the Republican takeover of the House, Obama has not vetoed a single bill. Every bill Congress has sent to him, he has signed. There is absolutely no way whatsoever that anyone can legitimately absolve Obama of all blame for the state of the country. So what's Krugman bleeding on about? What is this scorched earth opposition? It's Republicans not wanting to raise the top tax rate from 35% to 39.6%. Kinda like Krugman and his ilk crying that Congress cut the budget to the bone when in reality they just didn't raise it quite as much as Obama wanted them to. Oh, but how Krugman tries. Quote, This week's shocking refusal to implement debt relief by the acting director of the Federal Housing Finance Agency, a Bush-era holdover the president hasn't been able to replace, illustrates perfectly what's going on. And what is this Bush-era holdover? Quote, Edward DeMarco, the acting director of the agency that oversees Fannie and Freddie, refuses to move on refinancing. And this week, he rejected the administration's relief plan. Who is Ed DeMarco? He's a civil servant who became acting director of the Housing Finance Agency after the Bush-appointed director resigned in 2009. He is still there in the fourth year of the Obama administration because Senate Republicans have blocked attempts to install a permanent director. And he evidently just hates the idea of providing debt relief. Now hang on just a frickin' second here. DeMarco, according to Krugman, single-handedly stands in the way of the recovery, and Obama just hasn't been able to replace him because of those nasty Republicans in Congress. But here's the thing. As Krugman himself said, DeMarco is just acting director. That's a temporary position that's held until Congress and the president can appoint a permanent replacement. But the president can fire and replace people in temporary positions. There's absolutely nothing whatsoever stopping Obama from firing DeMarco and hiring another acting director to take up the temporary position in his place. Nothing at all. And if you think I'm wrong about that, listen to Krugman himself agreeing. Quote, President Obama, if re-elected, can and should replace him through a recess appointment. In fact, he should have done that years ago. As I said, Mr. Obama has made plenty of mistakes. Yeah, right. He's made plenty of mistakes, but he still holds no blame whatsoever for the fact that we're still in the longest recession since World War II. If Obama could replace him but hasn't, then how is he not responsible? Whatever happened to the buck stops here? Oh, and wait just a second. Something just hit me. What was that Krugman said about DeMarco? Repeating. 
He's a civil servant who became acting director of the Housing Finance Agency after the Bush appointed director resigned in 2009. 2009? Who was president in 2009, Krugman? Specifically, DeMarco was appointed by Obama on August 25th, 2009. Jeez. Not only that, but he does absolutely nothing to show why DeMarco himself is the one blocking the recovery. I mean, I thought Fannie and Freddie had nothing to do with the Depression. Apparently, they only did if you can make it look like Bush's fault. It's not even clear that DeMarco has that much power in his position. What if the Treasury Secretary decided that they were going to cover the debts anyway? What could DeMarco possibly do to stop him? This whole tirade smacks of election year scapegoating. Listen to Krugman bring it home. But the DeMarco affair nonetheless demonstrates, once again, the extent to which U.S. economic policy has been crippled by unyielding, irresponsible political opposition. If our economy is still deeply depressed, much, and I would say most, of the blame rests not with Mr. Obama, but with the very people seeking to use that depressed economy for political advantage. What he apparently doesn't see is that Obama is one of those very people, and it's his blindness to this incredibly obvious fact that means Krugman absolutely must be this week's biggest bogan emitter. And now let's spontaneously combust this week's Idiot Extraordinaire! The shooting at the Sikh temple in Wisconsin is a tragedy. The hearts of millions of Americans go out to the survivors and the loved ones of the victims. In such times of tragedy and strife and grief, you can always rely on Pat Robertson to make a complete ass out of himself and everyone who follows his extremist nutcase wing of his outdated Bronze Age religion. Yes, as could easily have been predicted without winning Randy's million, Robertson continued to blame tragedies on people he hates rather than those responsible. The shooting, according to him, is the fault of atheists. People who are atheists, they hate God, they hate the expression of God, and they are angry with the world, angry with themselves, angry with society, and they take it out on, on innocent people who are worshiping God. So Robertson is his usual hateful, bigoted self. Of course, the shooter wasn't even an atheist at all. Wade Michael Page was a member of ultra-fundamentalist white supremacy groups, including the Hammerskins. A former friend says that Page mentioned waging a racial holy war. Every indication says he was a fundamentalist Christian, as white supremacists tend to be. Sorry, Pat, but when one of your own does something, you don't get to blame others. Of course, even if Page had been an atheist, that still wouldn't have made all atheists, or even some atheists, responsible, making Robert's comments double bogus. I just abhor this kind of violence, and it's the kind of thing that we should do something about. But what do you do? Well, for a start, how about stop lying about the reasons why it's happened? What do you do? Well, you talk about the love of God and hope that it has some impact. Well, you're not showing much love of God or anyone else. All you show is hate and bigotry and division and discord and hostility. The sad part about this is, not only is Robertson not showing the love of God, he's not even showing the presence of mind of most Christians, atheists, Sikhs, or anyone else, really. He's so pathetic that he really is nothing more than this week's Idiot Extraordinary! Well, that wraps up this flaky, shaky, achy, breaky, wakey, bakey, angel cakey, double takey, toilet snakey, great salt lakey, vanilla milk shaky, and anti lock breaky edition of the Bogosity Podcast. Please visit the forums of Bogosity.tv where you can read the show notes and join the discussion on these and other subjects. This podcast is free, but not free to produce, so please use the donate button at the top of the Bogosity.tv website or down the right hand side of the podcast page and give generously to keep this podcast going. And if you'd like to contribute to the podcast, just send a question, statement, news article, or rant to podcast at bogosity.tv. Put it in an audio file, and if it's good enough, it'll get played right in the podcast. Thank you for listening. Until next time, here's a quote from Evelyn Beatrice Hall. I disapprove of what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. 
The Bogosity Podcast is licensed under Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 3.0 Unported License. Bogosity.